the U.S. border feeling the strain. This time, Chinese nationals are trying to enter the country illegally. Border Patrol officials noting a 900 percent spike in encounters. Cartels getting tens of thousands in cash to help smuggle them in, from 15,000 to 80,000. But why are they pouring into America? And what policies are being implemented? Welcome to China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. A surge of Chinese nationals jostling to enter America. U.S. border authorities noting a spike in Chinese migrants coming illegally into the U.S. via the southern border. That number jumping to 4,200 between October 2022 and February 2023, compared to under 2,000 in all of fiscal year 2022. For some, it took longer. A few people from China say it took them 46 days. The Chinese nationals tell NTD they are fleeing the Chinese Communist Party's repressive ideology. Faith, freedom, freedom of speech, we have no rights at all. But that number could be even higher. Officials say the Rio Grande Valley sector is seeing an over 900 percent increase in Chinese nationals over the same time last year. The CCP to people is a kind of cruelty. She decided to come to America three years ago after the start of the pandemic. The lack of medical resources during the pandemic reminded her of when she was a victim of China's one-child policy 20 years ago. I lost two of my babies. One was eight months old and the other was 23 days old. No medicine. At stake, thousands of dollars. Numerous reports noting Chinese nationals often paying between $15,000 up to a whopping $80,000 to get to the U.S. border. That's compared to the seven to $10,000 Mexicans pay, according to the Washington Times database of smuggling cases at the southern border. As for policy, each side is blaming the other. Republicans note the Biden administration rolled back Trump-era border protections, while the administration blames Republicans for voting against immigration reform measures introduced on the Biden White House's first day. Chinese leader Xi Jinping says he's preparing for war. He made the comment earlier this month, but the Chinese Communist Party, or CCP, seems to have been silently preparing for this moment for far longer, with officials working to ramp up China's military for decades. What is the U.S. stance toward China's military? Let's take a look. The People's Republic of China remains our number one long-term geostrategic security challenge. The PRC intends to be the regional hegemon in Asia within the next 10 years and to exceed the United States' overall military capability by mid-century, and they have publicly stated 2049. U.S. Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman General Mark Milley testified at a House Armed Services Committee hearing on the defense budget on Wednesday. He noted that China is on that path toward its goal, and that's disturbing. He singled out nuclear power, an unprecedented threat the U.S. is facing. For the first time, the United States is facing two major nuclear powers whose vital national security interests are in competition with the United States. Both the People's Republic of China and Russia have the means to threaten our interests and our way of life. But war with either one is neither inevitable nor imminent. Milley added, the U.S. not only has to keep pace, but also outpace the communist China in every sector. And this refers to conventional warfare, but also to advanced technologies such as AI, robotic, and quantum computing. Otherwise, the U.S. cannot assure the peace. We must remain the most powerful nation, and the great power peace then will be prevailing. The time is now. We have very little margin to wait. And the common thread critical to accomplish all of this is our people. And the decisiveness does matter. This military, the United States military, is ready. Mali believes the next five years are determinative for the U.S. relationship with China. He added, Iran, Russia, and China are boosting their partnership, and this will be a problem for years to come. A nationwide TikTok ban blocked on Wednesday in the U.S. Senate. Senator Josh Hawley tried to push the vote through. 
If passed, it would ban the Chinese-owned social media app from operating in the United States. But he was blocked by fellow Republican Rand Paul, citing concerns about free speech and uneven approaches to social media platforms. NTD's Jeremy Sandberg has more. Senator Paul on Wednesday objected to Senator Hawley's request for unanimous consent to fast-track a ban on TikTok in the U.S. They say, oh, the app's full of propaganda and your young people will be dancing into communism. Well, go to the app and search for Falun Gong. Go to TikTok and search for videos advocating Taiwan's independence. Criticism of Chinese President Xi Jinping. Videos are all over TikTok that are critical of official Chinese positions. That's why TikTok is banned in China. Lawmakers have expressed concerns over the app's influence through its algorithm, what is selectively shown to users. Paul says that all social media platforms collect user data. Do you want to protect privacy? Why don't we start by protecting our own privacy in this country? Paul says the Constitution prohibits bills of attainder. That's a bill against a specific person or company. He objected to Hawley's request for a roll call vote on the legislation. He says to have faith that Americans are smart enough to hear bad ideas and reject them. Have faith that our desire for freedom is strong enough to survive a few dance videos. Paul says a U.S. ban on the app would be infringing on the First Amendment rights of 150 million Americans and that people should just stop using it if they don't want their data collected. Senator Josh Hawley disagreed and cited national security concerns. A senator from Kentucky can watch as many dance videos as he wants. I have no objection to that. Could watch them on this floor for all I care, fine. What I object to is the Communist Chinese Party using this app on Americans' phones to spy on Americans without their consent. The senator says that Americans can simply not use this app, just turn it off. <laughs> That's not the case. Hawley says the app spies even when it's not being used. It tracks your keystrokes all the time. He suggested TikTok has been showering money to lobby politicians. I have never before heard on this floor a defense of the right to spy. I didn't realize that the First Amendment contained a right to espionage. Some Democratic lawmakers say they want to see a broad policy to address the issue, not just targeting TikTok, but other big tech firms as well. We absolutely need to have privacy laws. You know, we have to have privacy laws. And you can't just ban one company, even though TikTok is a major problem. You can't just ban a company. You need to have a comprehensive uh, privacy law. If you ban TikTok next week, there will be TikTok too the week after. It's not just TikTok, but it's American companies as well. And it's now time for us to put that comprehensive privacy bill of rights on the books. Senator Joe Manchin says he supports a ban on TikTok, but prefers an alternative bill over Hawley's. The one that makes all the sense in the world is a bipartisan one that basically Mark Warner and John Thune, Democrat and Republican, it's a bipartisan. It does a job and illegally, and it'll, it'll, pass, it'll pass the test of the courts. Hawley has vowed to continue efforts to pass the ban. Jeremy Sandberg, NTD News. A Chinese-owned app collecting data from U.S. citizens. But what makes that so different and so much more of an issue than a U.S.-based company doing the same? We spoke to Casey Fleming, CEO of Black Ops Partners, for his take. Casey Fleming, thank you so much for joining us. Great to have you back on the show. Thanks for having me. So TikTok has been in the spotlight a lot recently, especially its ties to the Chinese Communist Party with its parent company, ByteDance. And it seems now there's some discussion on what exactly is happening here. You have Senator Ed Markey saying it's not just TikTok, but it's also American companies that collect data, as in they should be treated the same. To begin, what is the big difference between the Chinese Communist Party doing that and American companies doing that, as in data collection? The U.S. Uh, has social media and they collect data on kids and uh, parents and anybody using social media. It's, it's really to exploit our kids. They do brain hijacking, and it's all about a dopamine cycle of all the clicks that they do. And it's really all about profits because it's for those companies, it's all about profits and market share and so on. The other side of the coin is what our enemies are using uh, the social media for, and, and namely that's the Chinese Communist Party. The CCP has named us their enemy for many, many years. Um, you have to understand they're working under unrestricted warfare. So this is a tool, social media is a tool in their war chest. It, it doesn't matter whether it's TikTok or whether it's Shine, the number two app right now in the United States, or whether it's 
um, Timu, which is the number three app and also the Amazon killer and also Chinese gaming apps. And now on the horizon, we have Lemon 8, which is the supposedly the TikTok replacement if, if the US government bans TikTok. It gives the developer, which is the Chinese Communist Party or anyone else, access to biometric data. That's voice recognition, face recognition, retina, fingerprint, mic, camera, your calendar, all of your contacts, your email, your files, your documents, your music. Here's a key point. They can custom install anything, okay? Not just what I just described. They can, they can custom install backdoors, other access, and so on. And also along with uh, your account info includes all your banking, your medical, basically all of your accounts. So again, would you allow a stranger to have access to this data? So the other side, we haven't talked about the CCP yet, the Chinese Communist Party, which is a sworn enemy of the United States. That's them, not us. So they use it as an intelligence weapon and also a cognitive weapon to distribute propaganda, to change your children's values and your values uh, into much more uh, uh, stronger values towards the Chinese Communist Party and against Americans or against the left or against the right or Democrats or Republicans or blacks or white to start to stir up that infighting. But what it also does is it, with all this, uh, this power in the hands of your children, it, uh, it, the harm that it causes is this brain hijacking changes their values, it causes infighting, antisocial behavior, it changes their thinking, it changes, it, it uh, limits their critical thinking capability, it increases their anxiety, their depression, their suicide. Um, so this is really something, you know, it, it's, you know, there is no difference between the US and China, the CCP, other than the nefarious use as a war tool a tool in the war chest by the CCP. With the US, you're still being exploited. It's still digital fentanyl um, that's being exploited for money and profit share. So anyway, thanks for letting me go on on that, but I needed to stay on a roll to get that all explained out. Casey Fleming also spoke about another Chinese-owned app, Lemon 8. With all eyes fixed on TikTok, one of its siblings quietly rose to the top 10 apps ranking in the US. Both apps have the same parent company, ByteDance, based in China. Which begs the question, will the same ongoing issues come up again? Let's take a look at the new app. Its blog style is considered a mix of Instagram and Pinterest. The New York Times reported that ByteDance sent messages to social media influencers, telling them about the new app. The messages also said that they used the same recommendation engine that helps TikTok succeed. Lindsey Gorman, a former tech advisor for the Biden administration, gave this assessment of Lemon 8. According to the New York Times, it's a social media platform like Instagram. It has to do with gathering information on users, and it has the same ownership structure, being a child of ByteDance. So I think the same issues are going to come up. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen's New York trip in the spotlight. On Wednesday, Tsai attended a dinner banquet in Manhattan, meeting with Taiwanese communities in the city. New Jersey Governor Phil Murphy also attended to show his support. Here are the details. During the event, Tsai said Taiwan would continue to preserve freedom and democracy, standing in solidarity with the West. She emphasized the island's crucial role in the global supply chain. Tsai also touched upon TSMC, the semiconductor manufacturer is largely credited with Taiwan's global dominance in the microchip making industry. The company announced plans to build a factory in Arizona back in 2020 to further advance its production on U.S. soil. Tsai is heading to Central America. The New York trip was part of her planned stopover in the U.S. She will also visit Los Angeles on her way back, expecting to meet with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy in California. China, on the other hand, threatened to retaliate if that meeting happens. On Wednesday, Washington urged Beijing. The People's Republic of China should not use this transit as a pretext to step up any aggressive activity around the Taiwan Strait. Despite having no formal diplomatic relationship, the U.S. is a major arms supplier to Taiwan. Tsai Ing-wen isn't the only Taiwanese official traveling this week. Former Taiwan President Ma Ying-jeou is in China, making him the island's first current or former leader to cross the Taiwan Strait since 1949. On Thursday, he visited a COVID-19 exhibition in China's central Wuhan city. The city is the site of the world's first COVID-19 outbreak back in late 2019. 
Wuhan and its 11 million residents were later put under full lockdown to contain the infection, with locals trapped inside their homes for months. Before arriving in Wuhan, Ma paid a visit to the Sun Yat-sen Mausoleum in Nanjing on Tuesday. There, he urged both sides of the Taiwan Strait, mainland China and Taiwan, to pursue peace and avoid war, saying, quote, we are all Chinese. Wuhan and Nanjing are two of several on Ma's 12-day itinerary, which features other stops in Shanghai, Changsha and Chongqing. Worth noting, the former leader won't visit Beijing during his stay. Meanwhile, he won't be shaking hands with Chinese leader Xi Jinping or other Communist Party officials. Though Ma has previously met Xi face-to-face in November 2015 in Singapore. Those talks signal the first Beijing-Taiwan leaders meeting in around 60 years. Ma's current trip to China comes just ahead of Taiwan's next presidential election. His policy of peace faces opposition from the island's current ruling party, which raises concerns that the former leader may bend to Beijing. The Chinese Communist Party views Taiwan as part of mainland China and has vowed to take over the island by force if necessary. That's despite never having ruled the island. Taiwan fiercely opposes that claim instead self-governing with its own constitution and leaders. A man accused of shooting and killing his boss pleading guilty. The two people worked for a Chinese-language newspaper based in California but controlled by the Chinese Communist Party. Here's the story. 63-year-old Zhang Chi Chen confessed to the murder of Yi Ning Xie, the LA founder and chairman of China Press, or Chiao Bao, in Mandarin. Chen pleaded guilty in a March 27th hearing. He will face a combined maximum sentence of 21 years in state prison. Chen is charged with involuntary manslaughter and the intentional use of a firearm. He also admitted to using a semi-automatic pistol and shooting Xia three times in the head, four times in the chest, and twice in the back. The shooting took place on November 16th, 2018. Investigators said at the time that they believed a workplace dispute led to the shooting, but a motive has not been officially released by authorities. Chen has been in custody since November 2018, and his sentencing is scheduled for May 1st. China Press is known for its pro-Beijing views among the U.S. Chinese immigrant community. In 2001, the Jamestown Foundation U.S. think tank listed China Press as an overseas Chinese newspaper. It claimed the newspaper was, quote, directly controlled by the Chinese government. After Xi's death, the newspaper's operation reportedly shrunk. Its West Coast edition switched from daily to weekly print distribution in July 2019. A new challenge to the dollar supremacy. China and Brazil are striking a deal to trade in their own currencies and ditch the U.S. dollar. Brazil is one of the largest economies in South Africa. And China is Brazil's largest trading partner, with two-way trade totaling over $150 billion. The U.S. ranks as Brazil's second largest trading partner. Trade volume between the two stands at over $90 billion as of last year. Brazil says it hopes the deal cuts costs and promotes even more bilateral trade. China also has similar currency agreements with countries like Russia and Pakistan. Saudi Arabia, a key U.S. ally in the Middle East, is inching closer toward China. The kingdom on Wednesday moving to join a security bloc as a dialogue partner. It's led by China. The bloc is called the Shanghai Cooperation Organization. China and Russia set it up in early 2000 to counter Western influence. Members now include India, Pakistan and former Soviet states in Central Asia. This comes less than three weeks after China helped Saudi Arabia and Iran resume their diplomatic relations. This is a big deal because the two countries had cut their ties for seven years. The two are also known as mortal enemies, having engaged in proxy fights in Yemen. Experts say the deal is a sign of China's increasing influence in the oil-rich region, and that holds significant meaning for the U.S., because Saudi is a traditional U.S. ally in the region. But relations between the two countries have been under significant strain, following the Biden administration's criticism over Saudi's human rights record and disputes over oil production. That's all for today's China in Focus on YouTube. We're now sharing a shortened version of our program here after being demonetized for two years. 
Here's what to look at for in our second half. Is green energy a double-edged sword for the U.S.? And how does it relate to the Chinese Communist Party, which labels America an enemy? We sat down with Rex Lee, cybersecurity advisor of MySmart Privacy, for details. The full episode is available on our partner platform, Epoch TV. To sign up, click the link down below. Thanks for watching China in Focus. I'm Tiffany Meyer. See you tomorrow.